Hello again, I'm Pastor E.B. Welcome to our Fear or Faith podcast, the official podcast of Zion Lutheran Church in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. You can find out more about us at zionalamo.org. This episode contains my sermon for Sunday, April 16th, 2023, based on 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-9, through 9, entitled, The Tested Genuineness of Your Faith. A daily devotion on this passage from Our Daily Bread noted that a gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without adversity. The abrasive experiences we encounter each day help to prepare us for heaven. God uses all of life's troubles to polish and perfect our character. If we accept our trials with the right attitude and recognize that the Heavenly Father is working through them, we will someday shine with splendor before Him. In the rough, a diamond looks like a common pebble, but after it is cut, its hidden beauty begins to emerge. The stone then undergoes a finishing process to bring out its full radiance. A skilled craftsman holds the gem against the surface of a large grinding wheel. No other substance is hard enough to polish the stone, so the wheel is covered with diamond dust. This process may take a long time, depending on the quality desired by the one who will buy it. This is similar to the way God works with us. The procedure is not pleasant, nor is it intended to be. The divine workman, however, has our final glory in view. We may be grieved by various trials, as Peter said, but when we understand what is behind them, we can rejoice even in adversity. God has one goal in mind during the refining process, that our faith may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Knowing this enables us to look beyond the unpleasantness of polishing to see the outcome. What do the trials of life reveal about us? How do we respond? What do others see when they look at us in times of of challenge, suffering, disappointment? How we respond to challenges, uncertainty, and crisis is a confession, more often than not a public confession, of our faith. Trials have an uncanny way of revealing what's inside a person. Consider the behavior of some passengers aboard the doomed luxury liner, the Titanic. As the great ship was sinking and the few lifeboats were being filled, the command on deck was women and children first. According to one survivor, most of the men and older boys obeyed the order, but some men, some men ran back to the ship's staterooms and changed into women's clothing in an effort to gain a seat on a lifeboat. The crisis, that crisis, brought out the worst in these men. What about us? How do we respond to the seemingly never-ending struggles in this life, such as anger, grief, lust, physical limitations, illnesses, ridicule, rejection, harassment, oppression, family and job pressures, disappointments, deep hurts, money problems? Well, I could go on and on. The list is seemingly infinite. How a person in or out of church responds to the difficulties of this life is a reflection of character. In a Christian, it's a reflection of of faith. But let's face it, life isn't easy. The Roman philosopher Lucius Aeneas Seneca, the younger, known more succinctly as simply Seneca, is an interesting character in the pagan world at the time of the apostles. In fact, the apostle Paul is considered by many historians to have been a contemporary with whom Seneca is said to have corresponded and whom he likely met in person in Rome. Seneca, like Paul, withstood many trials and tribulations during his life, from chronic asthma to the death of his only son to the wrath of more than one Roman emperor. Seneca became a Roman senator during the reign of the emperor Caligula, against whom he spoke out publicly. Caligula was so offended by Seneca that he ordered him to commit suicide. Seneca survived only because he was seriously ill, and Caligula was told that he would soon die anyway. In 41 AD, Seneca was exiled to the island of Corsica under Emperor Claudius, whose wife had accused him of adultery with Caligula's wife, but was allowed to return in 49 AD to become a tutor and later an advisor to Nero. 
Yes, that Nero, the emperor who blamed Christians, who were then violently persecuted and, persecuted and executed for the great fire that burned Rome in 64 AD. The following year, Seneca was accused of taking part in a plot to kill Nero. Nero ordered him to kill himself, which Seneca did by severing several veins and bleeding to death. In a short essay called On Providence, written in the last years of his life, Seneca wrote these words, fire tests gold, affliction tests strong men. Fire tests gold, affliction tests strong men. The Apostle Peter has something similar to say in our epistle reading this morning from the first letter, his first letter in the New Testament book that bears his name. He writes, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is meant by fire tests gold? Well, Martin Luther addresses this in his commentary on 1 Peter. It is the purpose, Luther writes, the purpose of the cross and adversities of all kinds to enable one to differentiate between the false and the true faith. God afflicts us in this way in order that our faith may be proved and made manifest before the world with the result that others are attracted to the faith and we are praised and extolled. For God will praise, extol, and honor us as we praise him. Then the false hypocrites who do not approach the cross and adversities in the proper way will necessarily be put to shame. All scripture compares temptation to fire. Thus here, St. Peter also likens the gold that is tested by fire to the testing of faith by temptation and suffering. Fire does not impair the quality of gold, but it purifies it so that all alloy is removed. Thus God has imposed the cross on all Christians to cleanse and to purge them well, in order that faith may remain pure, just as the word is, so that one adheres to the word alone and relies on nothing else. For we really need such purging and affliction every day because of the coarse old Adam. He goes on to say, Luther goes on to say, it is characteristic of a Christian life to improve constantly and become pure. When we come to faith through the preaching of the gospel, we become pious and begin to be pure. But as long as we are still in the flesh, we can never become completely pure. For this reason, God throws us right into the fire, that is, into suffering, disgrace, and misfortune. In this way, we are purged more and more until we die. No works can do this for us. How can an external work cleanse the heart inwardly? But when faith is tested in this way, all alloy and everything false must disappear. Then when Christ is revealed, splendid honor, praise, and glory will follow. In the short book of First Peter, there are at least eight specific references to suffering. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 warns of a fiery trial coming upon the community. Kind of makes you wonder, what were the first readers, his first intended readers, of this letter experiencing to cause him to write those words? The first two verses that open chapter 1 of First Peter tell us that Peter's intended recipients of this letter are those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, diaspora, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The five Roman provinces mentioned span the northern half of Asia Minor, that is the north part of Turkey today, and were areas in which Paul did not found churches. The word diaspora, or dispersion, is the word, as is the word elect, drawn from Jewish tradition. And so some commentators have concluded that the letter was addressed to Jewish Christians. More likely, however, Peter means to refer to all Christians who, like the exiled Jews, lived as strangers in their surrounding culture. It's thus closely linked with the word exile, as both point to Christians as people who share values other than those of the surrounding world, with the implication that, as a result, 
They will suffer for their nonconformity. I think we should hear that again. It's closely linked with the, world, with the word exile, as both point to Christians as people who share values other than those of the surrounding world. With the implication that as a result, they will suffer, they will suffer for their nonconformity. What does it mean to live in a potentially hostile world as true followers of Christ? And I would even remove the word, the word potentially. It can be a hostile world. Tales of persecutions faced by early Christians raise the possibility that Peter is addressing some sort of imperial, as in Roman Empire, imperial persecution. Roman emperors could lash out at religious groups perceived as unruly. And Acts chapter 18 mentions an expulsion of Jews from Rome in 49 AD by Emperor Claudius because, according to the first century Roman historian Suetonius, the Jews were indulging in constant riots. But during the lifetime of Peter, the only known persecution takes place at Rome after the great fire of 64 AD, for which Emperor Nero, Nero blamed the Christians. Church tradition places the death of Peter in this persecution that followed the great fire in 64 AD. However, most scholars rule out the persecution by Nero as the sole context for the, for the contents of 1 Peter. In the Greek and Roman world of the first century, Christian converts were noticed by their neighbors. It really should be that way today, that Christians should be noticed by their neighbors. Christians gathered in the first century regularly in homes for meals that were, that were secretive. Christians were suspected of immoral practices. In addition, Christian converts no longer participated in the regular rituals and sacrifices of Roman public life. People wondered if Christians were atheists, meaning atheists in the pagan world, not believing in pagan gods, uh, the gods that, that upheld the pagan state of the Roman Empire. Since the time of Augustus, the public worship of the Roman gods was expected patriotic behavior. Just as flag burning, refusing to stand for the national anthem, or declining to say the Pledge of Allegiance seems shocking to many Americans today, especially in a time of war, the behavior of the first Christians would have been viewed similarly by loyal Roman citizens. Such are the trials, as Peter tells his readers, that test the genuineness of your faith. The trials that test the genuineness of your faith. In verse 3, at the start of our text, Peter speaks of Christians as born again to a living hope. And here Peter uses a rare phrase in Greek stressing a new begetting, begetting rather than a new birth. That's literally what the Greek, Greek translates to. Certainly birth follows conception, but Peter's choice of language puts the emphasis on God's work in baptism rather than on the experience or participation of the Christian a consequence of God's new begetting is hope. Considering the tough situation faced by Peter's readers trying to cultivate a Christian lifestyle in a pagan world of anarchy, inequality, and injustice, not to mention declining morals and finicky gods and goddesses, this hope is significant. Hope is modified by the concept living. Hope is not vain or dead, a mere wish in the face of bleak reality, it is as certain as the resurrection of Jesus. As Peter writes, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. That's where it reads, we were begotten again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To reinforce this certainty, Peter compares this hope to an inheritance. Rights of inheritance were central to the family structure of, of antiquity. They were carefully protected. Cheating someone of a birthright was a grave offense. A grave offense. Peter assures his readers that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
To make his case even stronger, Peter uses three adjectives to describe this inheritance. Imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And note that each of these characteristics of this inheritance, this living hope, is also a characteristic of God. This is an inheritance that does not perish, just as God and the new creation to be ushered in at the end will never perish. It is as permanent as God. This is an inheritance that, that is, as Peter writes, kept in heaven for you. In other words, Peter is assuring his readers that this is an inheritance guaranteed, guaranteed by God himself. There's another aspect of suffering that is too often overlooked by struggling believers and many who continue to wonder why bad things happen to good people. On the one hand, good, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. On the other hand, only God knows why suffering is allowed to happen in this world, in this life. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, as we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. In a fallen world where troubles are part of life, the fact that God can use our suffering for good does not mean he causes our suffering just so he can do good things. The fact that God uses our suffering doesn't mean he causes our suffering. We suffer because we live in a dysfunctional and disordered, sin-driven world where bad things can happen and often do. We live in a world where people have free will and often exercise it irresponsibly, causing problems for themselves and for others. And it's important to understand this because Christians who are suffering sometimes wonder if they are being punished by God. I know, I've been there. And sometimes, many times, we don't see the bigger picture. Granted, it's difficult to discern God's will for us when we're struggling, yet how many of us have looked back at past challenges and connected the dots? It's then that the bigger picture the greater purpose comes into focus. Here's a modern day parable to illustrate that nothing in this life happens by chance. A young man named Eric is walking his dog Nova. The dog sees a rabbit, runs after it, pulling the leash from Eric's hand. The dog is soon lost and Eric spends several days frantically searching for Nova. After a week, Eric is devastated. He's upset about the bad luck of a rabbit jumping out just at the wrong time and leading Nova on a wild chase. After another week, a young woman named Vanessa rings Eric's doorbell with Nova in tow. After the emotional reunion with Nova, Eric slowly gets to know Vanessa and they fall in love. Eric realizes how lucky they were that Vanessa was at the right place at the right time to find Nova. Two months later, as Eric is driving to visit Vanessa, he is T-boned by a negligent driver. He suffers a severe head injury and tests are immediately done at the hospital. He is furious that his life could be ruined by this random accident when he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The next day, the doctor tells him of the results of the CT scan. There's a tumor growing in his brain. It had nothing to do with the accident from which Eric would make a full recovery. The tumor was discovered because of the accident and the CT scan. It was in its early stages and could be effectively treated. Normally, the tumor is discovered when there are symptoms, when it's almost always too late. The doctor tells him the car accident saved his life. A week later, Eric has successful brain surgery. Days later, Eric is at home recovering with Vanessa. To get some fresh air, he takes a Nova out for a walk. As Christian readers of Peter's first letter, nearly 2,000 years after the fact, his words are just as applicable to us as we face life's challenges. God has begotten us anew. Ours is a living hope based on the resurrection. Ours is an inheritance with God-like characteristics guaranteed by God himself. With this certainty, Peter's first readers could face hostility. With this certainty, we here in the 21st century can face the challenges that frighten us. 
Brothers and sisters, we too are grieved by the various trials so that the tested genuineness of our faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though we have not seen him, we love him. Though we, do not know, though we do not now see him, we believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We'll end here with Pastor Max Licato's introduction to his commentary on 1 Peter. Max writes, It's not easy being the only one in your family who goes to church. It's bad enough that they don't go. It's worse that they make fun of you for going. If you would pad your expense account, so could the other salesmen. But if you don't, they can't. Come on, they urge you, just a hedge, a little, but you refuse. The next day, someone has spilled paint on your car. Persecution, not by firing squad, not by death threats, not by the government, but it's persecution nonetheless. A more subtle persecution, persecution from friends, family, and peers. They won't take your life, but they will take your peace, and they'd like to take your faith if you let them. How do you respond? Begin with Peter's survival manual. He understood persecution, beaten and jailed, threatened and punished. He knew the sting of the false word and the angry whip. No doubt he'd seen some Christians stand and others fall. He'd seen enough to know what it takes to stay strong in tough times. His counsel may surprise you. His counsel may sustain you. It may be just what you need so that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. This episode is a part of our Fear or Faith podcast, coming to you from Zion Lutheran Church in Alamo, Texas. We live stream our service at 9 a.m. each Sunday, Central Time, on YouTube. So if you're not familiar with us or with the Lutheran Church, I invite you to join us online as we gather to worship our Lord each week. If you're somewhere near the nexus of the Rio Grande Valley universe, the conjunction of Interstates 2 and 69C, we invite you to come and worship with us in person. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you'll find inspiration and encouragement that only through patience and faith, not impatience and fear, can we effectively deal with life's issues with the help of God. You can reach us by email at fearorfaithpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Pastor E.B. saying so long, and God be with you.